And that's all just the beginning. All right, let's move quickly. We have a couple things to get to before our last two hours. We finish, first of all, this from uh, Dr. Scudder. Okay. Uh, again, continuing on this. He says, another example of using unscriptural terms. Make Jesus Lord of your life when sharing the gospel. Okay. You don't make Jesus Lord of anything. He was the Lord of the universe before you were ever born. Again, people often repeat these phrases not really understanding they must put their complete trust in Christ to get them to heaven. Remember, Romans does not teach we are brothers and then we believe. No, you must believe first before you are a Christian brother. James is writing very strongly about a Christian's growth in Christ to maturity. Though, although not all teach, that, uh, teach the same, most Calvinists teach that you are saved before you believe. It is never stated that way in the Bible. As a matter of fact, it's always stated the person believes first, then is saved. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that whosoever gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The confusion exists, you see, because many assume the fact that if God knew beforehand every person would get saved, then he must have chosen certain ones to be saved. John 6, 64. But there's some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. Nothing ever surprised God. Nothing ever surprised God. But the fact that he knows everything does not mean that he ordains everything. Christ knew all things from the beginning. Not only did he know who would believe, he knew all who could believe. He has given us our free will to do what we want, but he still knows whether you will believe and does not cause you to believe. Every oak tree that grows, God knows about that. Not only that, he knows every oak tree that will ever grow. Not every acorn did not develop into a tree. He knows about. Before the foundation of the world, he knew all this. Because our minds are finite, it's very difficult to grasp God knowing who will be saved and will not be saved. Here's a practical example. Suppose you happen to live in Chicago, experiencing the difficult winters and ensuing potholes in the road as a result. Gets cold, warm, cold, warm, cold, warm. It tears up the roads every year. You could presuppose what pothole you could hit and what pothole you won't have to worry about if the workers simply get out and do their jobs. In other words, there are lots of possibilities have to do with people's free will. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. But just because God knows every possibility does not mean he causes you to hit a pothole on the road. Because God knows everything. He knows how many souls I could win and the ones I will neglect to win. Truth is, life is a battle. And Satan fights against Christians who try to win others to the Lord Jesus. Many times we miss the opportunity to witness to an unsafe person or to simply neglect it. Oft times the church teaching Calvinism is very cold and barren because there's no purpose for them to exist. There's no emphasis on soul winning because what's the point? What's going to be is going to be. A dear friend of mine became a Calvinist simply because he didn't want the pressure of trying to win souls. And I believe that's one reason many people are becoming Calvinists today. It takes the pressure off of you. John 6, 65, and he said, Therefore I said unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. <clears throat> this verse is used by Calvinists to prove that you have to be given by the Father. Taking a verse like this out of context reminds us again of the sour soup illustration I gave earlier. So many take the attitude, if the word of God says it, of course it has to be true. A verse interpreted alone makes our sour soup and causes confusion. When looking at the context, it becomes clear, totally making sense. Furthermore, this verse does not mean that God, excuse me, does not mean that God preordained who would believe. He did know before the foundation of the world those who would believe. He also knows what would have happened if none had believed and what they would have done to reach others. The truth is, God knows all, the truth that God knows all things is beautifully illustrated, John 3.16. He doesn't only know what we will do, he also knows what we could have done. And if I be lifted up from the earth, 
will draw all men unto me. He said, God's got to draw you or he doesn't come. Who does he draw? Everybody, here's the message. You get the message to people, God draws them, and they decide what they wish to do with that. Okay. Yeah. This verse clearly shows that all are drawn to Christ, the same as being drawn to God. When Christ died on the cross, all men were drawn to the payment he made on the cross for their salvation. Still up to man to trust the payment Christ made on the cross. God did not predetermine who would believe. He did predetermine what would happen to those who would believe. He did not predetermine who would believe. He did predetermine what would happen to those who would believe. And they would be conformed to the image of his son. 2 Peter 3.9 the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some win count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. We see from many examples that James was abundantly clear he was writing to the already saved brethren. Clearly from scripture, we see Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness. Trusting in the promise of God, he knew Isaac was in the bloodline of the Messiah. When Isaac was offered, Abraham also prayed and believed in the bloodline. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac until he had received the, pro uh, received the promises, offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Accounting our God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. I've often considered the question, could Abraham have offered Isaac if he believed Isaac would not have been raised from the dead? I don't really know, but I doubt it. Now, is this an incredible act of faith? Yes, it was one of the greatest in the whole Bible. I'm looking forward to sitting down and talking to Abraham about it when I get to heaven. I got a lot of things I'm looking forward to talking to people in heaven about. I don't know how God does things there, but I already got my list of questions started. Genesis 15, verse 5 and 6. He brought him forth abroad and said, Look, move toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. John 3, 16, 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. To be called a friend of God as Abraham was, you need to grow in faith and maturity as a Christian. In heaven, you will have so many rewards and blessings, you will realize all the trials and testing on earth were worth it. Study 15. This is going to be a bit of an unusual study. We're going to talk about uh, Sandman, uh, Robert Sandman and John Glass. Now you're likely to say, I've never heard of them. You probably haven't. You probably would never have heard of them without this class. You will probably never hear of them again. So a reasonable question is, why are we taking the time to talk about these two people that we're never going to hear of? I came across Robert Sandeman by accident when I was uh, studying for one of the books I was writing. It wasn't really what I was, was subject I was on, but, but I noticed him and some people said, oh, he's a terrible man. What he came along and he said about salvation was just terrible. But when they quoted him, I said, this doesn't sound terrible. This sounds like exactly what the Bible says. So I got intrigued. The Christian Theological Seminary, I was pastoring in Indianapolis at the time, Christian Theological Seminary, very liberal seminary, but a very big school and a very big library, and they would allow any local pastor to come use their library. And um, I found that books written by Sandeman and Glass uh, that weren't in print at that time were in their rare books room. And they would let me come to the rare books room and read those books. They are back in print now, and I own a set of them. But I spent many hours at their seminary rare book room reading the books by Glass and Sandeman. 
And I noticed as people described them, talk about how terrible they were. And they called them names because they kept saying salvation was by faith only. So what's so wrong about that? Have we not read it over and over again directly from the scriptures in the last few days? So here was the point that I thought was worth noting. If you stand clearly for the gospel as it is in the Bible, there will be people who misquote you. They will attack you. They will try to intimidate you. They will try to misrepresent you. It's not new. Okay. It's very common for those who wish to add to the gospel of salvation by faith to call people who teach salvation by faith only as followers of Robert Sandeman. We're told he's such a bad guy. We've never seen any of his books. We don't know what he wrote. We say, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm not a follower of Sandeman. Oh, I'm not either. But I think the stories we're noting. Biography from Michael D. Madigan. For most, the Lordship controversy began in the late 1970s to the early 1980s. However, in an article entitled History Repeats Itself, J.I. Packer correctly noted, the view that saving faith is no more than the belief of the truth about Christ's atoning death, belief of the truth about Christ's atoning death, the view that saving faith is no more than the belief of the truth about Christ's atoning death is not new. It was put forward in the mid-18th century by the Scot, Robert Sandeman. The average free grace proponent was told that his view of saving faith was nothing more than a revival of Robert Sandeman's theology. He would most likely ask, who's Robert Sandeman? After discussing the ministry of Sandeman, ill effects of his view, Parker concludes by stating, the narrow intellectualism of Sandeman's view of faith dampened life-changing evangelism. This was one reason why the Glassite Sandeman denomination did not survive. Nevertheless, Sandeman's motto, contending earnestly for the faith as once delivered in the saints, clearly demonstrates he was not vying for denominational superiority. Rather, he was earnestly, merely earnestly contending for the faith. Therefore, while Packer's observation was correct concerning the demise of the group as an organized fellowship, the impact that the theology of Robert Sandeman has had upon the church for the last 250 years cannot be ignored. While there were certainly many who influenced Sandeman, John Glass, his father-in-law, had one of the greatest effects upon his life. 1744, at the age of 26, Sandeman was appointed as the elder of Glass congregation and became their primary literary publisher. The most controversial and widely read of his works was Letters on Theory and Aspasia. The work was the distinction between Sandeman and James Hervey, a well-known Calvinist minister from North Hampshire, concerning Hervey's work, Dialogues between Theory and Aspasia. In this book, Har Hervey concentrated on the doctrine of justification by faith. South comments. Hervey had been influenced by John Wesley at Oxford but later asserted that he had altered his view of how salvation is obtained through correspondence with George Whitfield. This dialogue brought Sandeman's theology in the spotlight. Okay. In what Glass and his son-in-law Sandeman are arguing against, people were saying saving faith is more than just trusting Christ. Saving faith is a commitment to live for him. You have to live in spiritual triumph to be saved. Real saving faith is more than just trusting Christ. And that's the Calvinist doctrine of preservation of the saints. What Glass and Sandeman were saying is this Calvinist doctrine is coming out of the Calvinist churches into many of our other churches and getting people to mistake salvation by works call it salvation by faith, but they're telling people that they have their works and their commitment to works is part of their salvation. And so Sandeman and Glass devoted a great deal of their life to warning people 
that there are folks who are misunderstanding and misrepresenting the gospel in our very churches. And he ends up in a debate with this writer, Hervey, over the subject. Adam and wrote, but one thing in the gospel may be freely said, that where the faith necessary to justification is described, a repetith, word, name, or phrase, prefixed or subjoined to faith, not meant as a description of the truth believed, but of some good motion, disposition, or exercise of the human soul about it is intended and really serves instead of clearing our way to blindfold and decoy us, to impose upon us, to make us take brass for gold and chaff for wheat, to lead us to establish our own in opposition to divine righteousness, even while our mouths and our ears are filled with high sounding words about the latter. So it's gotta be complete faith. It's gotta be sincere faith. It's gotta be committed faith. None of that helps us understand. All of that does just the opposite. It makes it harder for us to see clearly what the gospel is. There are men, Bible colleges, movements among independent Baptists today who are doing this very thing. Uh, lately, they've been criticizing people. And, and independent Baptists, they say, well, these folks only, talking about folks like myself or Pastor Scudder, folks, they, they're just stressing only believe. Sure, we're stressing only believe. What does the Bible teach? And, and then you get into all these discussions about how much, how perfect your faith has to be and what, how much commitment, etc. 200 years later, Earl Rodmacher echoed Sandeman's sentiment with these words. We need to be aware of the tendency to over the word faith and add it to more semantic baggage than it was ever intended to carry by distinguishing faith and saving faith or some other kind of faith. Okay? So he said, saving faith is when you've committed your entire life to the Lord and made the Lord uh, the Lord of every area of your life. Well, first of all, as I said, you do not make the Lord Lord of anything. He's the Lord of the universe before you were ever heard of. And you can say, I've, and I always ask when people say this, have you made the Lord the Lord of every area of your life? And they'll say, absolutely. I said, really? You never sin? And I said, well, well, no, I still sin. I still make mistakes. Well, you said the Lord was Lord of every area of your life. If the Lord was Lord of every area of your life, would you sin? The answer is no. No one has ever done what these people are telling lost people they have to do to be saved. You need to tell lost people to believe. You need to tell them it's good news. Say, well, you've got to give every part of your life to Christ. That is not good news because you can't do it and you don't know anybody that has. I'm personally acquainted with a number of people who would tell you, you can't be saved unless you give Christ, uh, make Christ the Lord of every area of your life and that they've made Christ the Lord of every area of their life and they are some of the most arrogant, proud, difficult, obnoxious people I've ever met in my life. They do not have even a basic testimony of spirituality, but they will tell you in a hurry how the Lord is the Lord of every area of their life. See? The closer you get to the Lord, the more humble it makes you, not the more proud. The more it focuses you on Christ, not on yourself. Now, Apparently, just as the word faith has been over psychologized in the 21st century, so it was in Sandeman's day. Sandeman said that justification comes from what he called bare faith. Bare faith. In 1760, word reached Sandeman in London that his work Letters on Theory and Aspasia caused quite a stir in the American colonies. Couraged by their response to his views on bare faith, Sandeman, with John Glass's blessing, left England for America. Sandeman became an elder of a congregation in Danbury, Connecticut, where he died April 2, 1771. 
Sandemanianism. Theopoda has this brief explanation of what has come to be called Sandemanianism. Sandemanianism refers primarily to an aspect of theology regarding the nature of faith promoted by Robert Sandeman, from which it derives its name and his father-in-law, John Glass, in Scotland and England during the mid-18th century. To the Sandemanians, the nature of saving faith reduces to a mere intellectual assent to a fact or proposition. This is illustrated rather clearly in the following quote. In a series of letters to James Harvey, the author of Theron and Aspasia, he, Sandemanian, maintained that justifying faith is a simple assent to the divine testimony concerning Jesus Christ, differing in no way to its character from belief in any ordinary testimony. Those holding to the concept of lordship salvation argue that the view espoused by proponents of non-lordship salvation is essentially the errant view of the 18th century Sandemanianism. From the very famous theologian, Martin Lloyd-Jones. He says the exact, the vital question he is attacking Sandeman. He says the vital question is what is the true nature of saving faith? Perhaps the simplest way of putting it before you is to read a short extract from Robert Sandeman's book. The matter on the title page of the book is one thing is needful. One thing is needful. And all along one leading point is kept in view which the author calls the sole requisite to justification or acceptance with God in opposition to those who openly avow only one meritorious cause of justification do yet lead the guilty to seek some inward motion, feelings or desires in some way requisite in order to acceptance with God. In other words, they're teaching you, you have to reach this level of dedication before you have saving faith. It creates, they would say, oh, that's not works. It's just getting rid of all your sin. Just being committed to do right. Okay. Whereas, are we saved by faith or are we saved by faith plus commitment? Are we saved by faith and what Christ did for us on the cross? Are we saved by a full, complete, full, complete faith that knows everything we should know? Among those to whom he refers, he ranks Isaac Watts, Philip Doddridge, Thomas Boston, Erskins, amongst the others, John Wesley, whom he vilified, regarded as one of the most dangerous men who ever appeared in the church. By the sole requisite, he understands the work finished by Christ in his death and proved by his resurrection to be all sufficient to justify the guilty. I'll read that again in a moment. To be all sufficient to justify the the guilty. I think this is the terrible thing he taught. That the work finished by Christ in his death and proved by his, requisition, his resurrection to be all sufficient to justify the guilty. See, he's saying you can be justified by believing in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the terrible thing Sandeman did. Because there was no works added to it. That is the temptation in front of us today that so many fall into. And so I'm reading, it's Sandeman, he's a terrible guy because he believed that you could be justified simply by believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But how many times does the Bible tell us that? We've read it dozens and dozens of times already in this course. Now here's the point. He maintains the whole benefit of this event conveyed to men only by the apostolic report concerning it, that everyone who understands this report to be true or is persuaded the event actually happened as testified by the apostles is justified, finds relief to his guilty conscience, that he's relieved not by finding any favorable symptoms about his own heart, but finding their report to be true. You see, he's saying that you can have faith and relief and confidence. You're on your way to heaven just because of what Jesus did for you instead of seeing how you've grown spiritually. The, our Baptist churches are full of this today. we got more to say here. But 
let me, to make it still more plain and clear, give you Principal John McLeod's view of it. He says that teaching a glass is fitted to put a premium upon what's held to be orthodox doctrine to lay less stress than is called for on the reaction of the emotional nature, the truth of the gospel, and the activity of the will as that goes out in the trust of the heart and its attendant obedience in the life. He's saying you're putting, he's teaching, you put your trust in what Jesus did instead of how the emotions it gave you and how you've lived an obedient life. In other words, faith instead of works. Westminster Confession, as you know, puts great emphasis on this trust of the heart. And that is not merely an intellectual acceptance of the facts. In fact, as Principal Cloud points out, the Santa meeting teaching was in a way a return to the Roman Catholic teaching, which is all you have to do is believe and then accept the teaching of the church. No, it isn't. He wasn't say, if you have faith in the Roman Catholic Church, say, if you have faith in what Christ did for you on the cross of Calvary. Okay. You accept that with your mind, that's all that's necessary. So he ends by saying, it held itself coldly aloof from any display of feelings in the exercises of a religious life. Now that's the very essence of the matter. The same thing is put quite clearly by Andrew Fuller. He says it is a bare belief of the bare truth. It excludes from it all pertaining to the will and affections except as fruits produced by it. They think it's not your works. I mean, works might be the fruit, but the works aren't part of the faith. I was astonished some years ago. I've always gone to things out of curiosity. The Seventh-day Adventists were having their national convention in Indianapolis while I was pastoring in Indianapolis. So just to see for myself, I went to their national convention. And they had a lot of Seventh-day Adventist books, and one of them entitled, Salvation is by Faith. It's being sold by the Seventh-day Adventists. Well, that's not my understanding what the Seventh-day Adventists believe. That doesn't make any sense. So I, I bought the book. I took it home. First half of the book, it said over and over again, Salvation is by Faith, Salvation is by Faith, Salvation is by Faith. Chapter after chapter, I, halfway through, I thought, have I misunderstood the Seventh-day Adventists all this time? And then I got to a chapter entitled The Definition of Faith in which they said faith is a commitment to keep the Ten Commandments. So the faith they say that saves you is a commitment to keep the Ten Commandments. That's not faith. That's works. It's works called faith. So I mean, that's what the whole Seventh-day Adventist movement was based on. Calling certain works faith. Because they knew the Bible refers to salvation by faith over and over again. So we're just going to call certain works faith. But as years went on, I began to hear the same thing over and over again from the Calvinist crowd. You're saved by faith. But faith is a commitment to work. And I wasn't terribly surprised because that kind of fits with perseverance of the saints. But as the years went on, I began to can't come across this again and again and again in our independent Baptist crowd to where this day I think about half of our independent Baptists believe this. That salvation by faith is a commitment to live for the Lord and is actually their calling faith works. Our calling works faith. And when Sandeman and Glass, he said, wait a minute, you're not saying this right. And he was particularly talking in independent churches. He said, you're, you've allowed the Calvinists to influence the way you say this. You're not saying this right. People will hear you and be misled. They will trust their works. And they all got angry at him. And they all called him a heretic. And they all called him names. And they refused to fellowship with him. William Williams puts it like this. It's that naked faith, naked faith as the chief thing, believing without power, making little of conviction, and having a broken heart. So you, can say, you can get saved without a broken heart for sin and a commitment to live godly. Where in the scripture describing salvation does it tell you you have to have a broken heart to first be saved? Where did God say that? Human theologians say that. 
My heart wasn't broken when I got saved as a 10 year old boy. I was thrilled to death. There was an answer to the problem of my sin. There you have an idea as to what this particular teaching was. I'm going to go over about 10 minutes and then we'll take our break. Its proponents were very fond of putting it like this. We are asked to believe that the testimony of God in the scriptures is we believe any other testimony. They said, you believe the testimony of man, so you must believe this. So there's a difference in the object of what you believe, but they taught as regards the belief itself, there's no difference between believing the testimony, the ordinary testimony of a man or a witness in a court or in private, believing the testimony of God in the scriptures. They said some, something, you have to have some kind of special faith to believe this. They went beyond saying that faith and other things were not the ground of justification. They said it must be just naked belief. They therefore excluded all endeavors and prayers and religious exercises. They said, they're saying you don't have to endeavor or pray or do things. That's exactly right. What did the thief on the cross do? And that appeals that come to us and so on. That's the essence of their position. So what kind of things were they criticizing? What did they say? Sandeman and Glass say that got him in trouble. Here's Robert Sandeman. The gospel was never intended to improve the righteous and elevate them to a higher condition, but to relieve the wretched. But to relieve the wretched. But it says not works. It's relief to the sinner. He also said in the same apostle shows us at large his epistle to the Galatians that however zealous Christians we may be, if we add to Christ's death, if we add to Christ's death, any requisite whatsoever in the matter of acceptance with God, if we add to Christ's death, any requisite whatsoever in the matter of acceptance with God, Christ shall profit us nothing. Christ is become of no effect to us. He said, we've missed it. If we add anything to Christ's death as part of the issue in salvation, it's not Christ's death and my sincerity. It's not my Christ, my Christ's death and my abandonment of my sin. It's not Christ's death and my baptism. It's not Christ's death and my faithfulness. It is Christ's death that provided for my salvation. And then he wrote, they do not understand the base word of faith or Christ's death alone gives them peace with God without some pious quality or other, which they secretly either hope to attain or presume they already acquire. So they, they cannot separate salvation from works. And thus they would animate men to work out their own justification before God by diligently following after righteousness. And then what else can be faith, be the faith, which they are wrought up to, but to persuasion that they are much more righteous and worthy of the divine favor than others. Man, he nailed it. I said, man, you have to live godly to have assurance of salvation. And what they're saying is you have to live godly like me to have assurance of salvation. Their faith is not leading them to humility. It is leading them to pride. One of the people I know that I have had very direct dealings with this, and he will tell you, man, you, have, you cannot be saved if you're not living in victory over all sin. Is one of the proudest, most obnoxious, gossip-filled, person who is just a pain and a difficulty to everybody around him. But he will tell you that's proof that he's saved because he's superior. The reason he's so obnoxious is because he's superior. And the reason he's so rude is because he's so righteous. And the reason he's so unkind and such a discouragement to his own family members is because he is so godly. He's filled with pride, but he's so proud he thinks his pride is humility and proof he's saved, where not so much you. Again, Sandman writes, to avoid the absurdity 
of saying we are justified by aught else but faith, they commonly divide faith into as many different acts or motions as will serve their purposes. Statements from John Glass. To oblige us to depend wholly on his righteousness for acceptance with God as his children, it's all iniquity, not to be pleased with an imperfect righteousness. The sacrifice of Christ alone makes us perfect pertaining to the conscience. The sacrifice of Christ alone. To this purpose, as I have often observed to you, that the gospel distinguishes itself by a peculiar simplicity. And the corruption of Christianity is but a departure from this. As I have observed to you, the gospel distinguishes itself by a peculiar simplicity. The book that Pastor Scudder and I wrote together is entitled Evangelism Made Simple. The title was my suggestion. That the real gospel is simple. Evangelism made simple. Now, I'm reading Sandy and Glass, and they say, oh, that's terrible, they're horrible people, they're heretical people, they're bad people. They're and then I get to actually reading about them, and I actually get to reading them. They're saying that because they teach salvation is by faith alone. Guess what? If you're going to teach, the just shall live by faith, and the gospel in harmony there are going to be some people who don't like it. They are going to misquote you. They're going to misrepresent you. They're going to call you names. They're going to try and intimidate you into changing this position because you don't want people to say bad things about you. Are you ready for what I'm gonna say next? If you're gonna be faithful, to the Lord and the word of God, you have to be prepared to be criticized. And not let the criticism bother you. The more God uses you, the more you will be criticized. In this day and age of the internet, where I can say something one morning in the Philippines and people are talking about it in Greece the next day, you're gonna get criticized from a lot of directions. It, over the last year, uh, the people reading and listening to my sermons on the internet seems to have multiplied uh, all over the world. And I am receiving comments, several comments, every single day from around the world. And I am criticized every single day from around the world. I mean, there is not a day that goes by. I have been criticized already that I'm aware of at least three times this morning before we start a class, at least three times Filipino time for this morning before we start a class. And what I get criticized about, two things over and over again. I believe in the simplicity of the gospel just as it's described in the word of God. And because I trust the King James Bible. Guess what? It goes with the territory. It's part of the program. If you're going to be faithful to the word of God, and this is true about anything, but we're talking about the doctrine of salvation this week. If you will be faithful to the word of God, the doctrine of salvation, you're going to have to be prepared to be criticized. And you've got to get to the place you don't let it bother you. All you have to do is know your theology is based on plain, clear statements of the scripture. And you let other people figure out what they're going to do about that or how they're going to react to that or what their thought about it is going to be. Yeah. Jesus was criticized by the Pharisees. Paul was criticized by his fellow Christians. Born again believers. It goes with the territory. Paul was being criticized by fellow preachers while he was in prison 
for serving the Lord? His response was, notwithstanding in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And there I rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. He said, some of the people that are criticizing me are preaching the gospel and winning people to Christ. He said, I'm glad they're winning people to Christ. This was never about us. If you think it's about applause and hang out everybody like you and everybody before you and everybody clap for you and everybody cheer for you, you're in the wrong business. It is about being faithful to the Lord. And God will give you moments when people are grateful to you for it and they will be a blessing to you. But the more God uses you, the more criticism there will be. Be prepared for it. But I have a reason to be faithful and a reason to be thankful and a reason to take whatever criticism comes. You know why? Because Christ died for me. And I am on my way to heaven, not because my faith is sincere, pure, complete, or perfect. Not because my works have reached a certain level. Not because I've accomplished everything I wanted to or should have. Not because I've managed to live a life that has no sin in it. If losing your temper is a sin, I got a lot still on my account on this earth. And now I wrestle all the time not to lose it again. It was, I live in victory and they don't have to wrestle with sin and victory comes automatic. Good for you. It doesn't come for me on some things. But I have absolute assurance. And I gave the illustration the other day when I was in the hospital. And the doctors are talking about my dying. And I'm turns out falling asleep but I don't know what's happening I don't know whether I'm falling asleep or I'm dying I really don't and I have a few moments of consciousness to think about that I fall asleep and if it had been dying I would have died in absolute assurance that heaven was my home and that salvation was mine not because there are no doubts about me, but because there are no doubts about him. I gave you the story of my father getting saved and the preacher gave him the gospel for the first time. And he said, uh, preacher, you don't know what I have done. And I'll never forget the preacher's response. He said, Bob, that's not the problem. The problem is you don't know what he has done. No, I fell asleep that day in the hospital with absolute assurance because I knew what he has done. Not because I knew what I have done. Yeah, I so say I woke up, first thing I saw was a clock. I literally woke up, my first thought was, am I in heaven or am I in the hospital? And I saw a clock. I said, I don't think they have clocks in heaven. I don't think they need clocks in heaven. And then I realized my, I'm, I'm strapped into this machine and I'm in a breathing tubes in my nose and all that. I'm pretty sure you don't have any of that in heaven. Pretty sure I'm in a hospital. The, the only thing I could reach, I'm strapped into everything, was the TV remote control. It's about two o'clock in the morning and so I turned the TV on and this really stupid program came on and I dropped the remote and I couldn't reach it. And so I was watching that TV program and I remember thinking, purgatory is true. Here I am in purgatory. I, I can't turn this off. I can't get away from it. There's no nurse to turn it off for me. I'm in purgatory. <coughs> no, I didn't have any question because I knew what he did. Okay. Let's take a break. We'll come back to our question and answer time.